And the goal is we want to get you off an opioid, even oral, before you go home. Is that generally the stated objective of the medical system now is whatever opioids you're going to need, let's try to deliver that to you in the hospital? I wouldn't say necessarily because I think there are some surgeries that are going to clearly require okay. um, prescribing an opioid after surgery. Remember, the, day, the name of the game is get people out of the hospital and have the care take place in their home. And people are going to need some degree of pain management and analgesics. And those analgesics can be Tylenol, NSAIDs. If it's more than uh, you know, mild, moderate pain, it may involve an, uh, an opioid. So how are you thinking about that? How are you thinking about extracting the value of the opioid and minimizing the risk of long-term dependence? What we have learned is that there are vulnerabilities that people bring to an injury or surgery and being placed on opioids that set them up for more likelihood of persistent opioid use. Mm. And we've characterized, we and others, through research studies, have characterized many of these factors. So um, some of these factors include uh, preoperative depression and anxiety, uh, higher levels of catastrophizing, uh, uh, early adverse child events, so a history of PTSD, history of physical, sexual, psychological trauma. All of these set someone up to have a higher likelihood of persistent pain and persistent opioid use. Now, you will note, um, all these things I said, most of these things I said, people would normally put under the psychological umbrella. The key message that I want to give people, and I, I think I think people, I think everyone's getting this, is when we talk about psychology and psychological factors, we're talking about neurosciences. We're talking about the brain, and we're talking about specific brain systems, regions, networks. So we did a study several years ago. This was led by Jennifer Ha. Uh, Ian Carroll was a key player uh, leader on this. And we found that uh, higher depression scores preoperatively predicted much more likelihood of persistent opioid use after surgery. And how are you screening for this? What tests and are you using? Back then, we used something called the Beck Depression Inventory, which um, standard instrument, we don't use that anymore. Uh, there's more modern tools. I thought what was cool about this, we did a factor analysis on the original paper, and you can break the Beck down into different components of depression, anhedonia, cognitive, blah, blah, blah. What we found is there was a particular factor that drove almost entirely that prediction of depression, self-loathing. It was feeling like really bad about your... So if you have someone who just suffers from, not that anhedonia is anything but unpleasant, but if... They're only experiencing anhedonia, but no self-loathing, you would say, well, the risk isn't as high. Yeah. You know, conceptually, your argument holds, but now I'm going to come back to a lot of the things that you write about, which is the danger of drawing inferences from small population studies and generalizing that to the rest of the world. Yeah, especially with that randomization, because what you really would like to be able to see is you take a whole bunch of people in, you get their incoming metrics of anhedonia, dysthymia, self-loathing, you categorize all the arms and tentacles of depression, yeah. and then you randomize within each of those to with and without opioid strategies. Yeah. And then you, I mean, this is a very complicated thing to do, but if you want to know the answer, that's kind of the way you want to do it. That's exactly it. Unfortunately, there's not much will to do that in society these days. Even, even in the world we live in today where we understand that for a non-zero, potentially non-trivial segment of the population, the introduction to opioids that ultimately destroys people's lives is delivered by the medical system? I was on the Institute of Medicine panel, now the National Academy uh, panel called Relief, and we did a report called Relieving Pain in America. And I remember sitting around back in 2010, and we were talking about the state of pain in the country and where we needed to go, identify a perfect vision, and also identify 
what are the biggest research questions to ask and answer? And I remember a really vigorous discussion here, and the one that I put forward and others put forward is, we need to better understand what is the long-term effectiveness and safety of prescribing opioids to people with chronic pain, meaning we need to figure out for whom opioids work. Um, today, we still don't have an answer to that question, and there's very little will to do it because the whole message in the scientific community is basically find non-opioid choices. So there's not a lot of interest in funding the studies to figure out for whom it works. There is a lot of active interest still, mainly through data-driven studies, to find out who is at risk. But that type of study that you're talking about and others that are of longer term and bigger consequences, I just don't know when they're going to get done, who's going to fund those. Thank you.